La diffusion vient de démarrer. Tous les participants sont en mode écoute seul. Là, ça fonctionne pas de Marie pour les diapos. Oh. We're ready? Yes, we have sound. Do you hear me? Yep. Okay. Good day, everybody. Welcome to this uh, third webinar uh, the, from the series The Barn, a Source of Comfort, uh, presented by the Dairy Farmers of Canada in collaboration with Valacta today. Uh, today, as usual, <laughs> we're old buddies yeah. now. I am I'm with, uh, yeah, uh, I'm with Dr. Trevor DeVries from the University of Guelph, and we're back at the head office of Valacta. We're back and in a new space again, so we've kept that fresh by having <laughs> different locations every time. So exactly, exactly, and actually I would like to thank the people from the McDonald campus who uh, gave us a hand and, and lent us a, a room uh, very quickly last week. And uh, we're um, accompanied today by uh, groupies that came just for Dr. DeVries. <laughs> So we might have questions from the room. Welcome, everybody, and welcome to you as well. Today, for this last webinar, we are going to discuss the space, the space in the barn for the cow. Um, we have an hour and a half ahead of us, and if you have any questions or comments as we go along, as always, you can send them uh, via the chat box uh, at the right bottom of your screen. And today, be, because as usual, we would like to know a little bit who you are. We're a bit limited, but the, the question that will give us the best idea of what's your situation at the farm, we would like to know what type of barn you have, uh, everybody, uh, each uh, in your province today. So uh, we will, we will uh, launch the first question of the day. It's what type of barn do you have? Is it a Thai style? And Marie, I think we need to change the slide and it's not working. <laughs> All right, so uh, tie stall, free stall, uh, hay sack, bed and pack, yeah, bed pack, and uh, or, or maybe you don't have a barn, so this will give us an indication that you're a cow lover as we are, but <laughs> you don't have a barn. So uh, can we send the first question? Exactly. All right. So uh, while while they're answering the first question, Trevor, I think we need to go for a cheers, a first cheer yeah, of the day. <laughs> All right, so today along with us we have, oh, it's a little bit small for us here. So uh, most people are freestyle, actually, we, I don't see, it must be somewhere along, yeah, oh, no. Most people are not dairy producers today. <laughs> All right, so. so. We're either scaring the producers away. <laughs> <laughs> or we're attracting more people from the industry. Exactly. I'd like to think it's more positive, so hopefully we're... They, yeah, exactly. They will relay yeah. our messages today, too. Uh, so 10%, a little bit high stall and a, a little bit free stall today. So but anyway, we will be covering topics both. For, for both. Exactly. Uh, we will go back to our PowerPoint. Uh, as always, if you have a Twitter account, uh, we invite you to tweet during the webinar or after under the hashtag Comfortable Barn um, and, and keep the conversation going on this very important topic. If you have missed the first two webinars, I would like to tell you that everything that we will discuss today and that has been discussed uh, in the first two webinars is present or is presented in this guide that's available on the Dairy Knowledge website or in the document section of Balacta's website. During the webinar today, you will see at the top right of your screen uh, page numbers, and uh, on those page numbers refer to where the material that we're discussing is presented in the guide. Um, Trevor, before we move on to our main topic of the day, I think it's, it's uh, worthy of reminding ourselves how 
we can we can detect comfort or discomfort in the barn by looking at our cows, observing yeah, our cows. Yeah, so, so one of the basis that we've kind of gone on in this webinar series is to look at the cows in their environment. So looking at, uh, specifically looking for signs of bad comfort. So as you see on the screen, things like injuries on cows, injuries to the legs of cows, to the uh, knees of cows and the necks, uh, looking at lameness uh, and, and as well, we, we know that these uh, may be issues on our farms. We've had uh, varying uh, prevalence rates, estimates of those things, knowing that uh, some farms that is a struggle and, and so we know that comfort can be an issue in those cases. Yeah. And then we can also look at how then the cow interacts with her environment in terms of her behavior. So how she gets up and lies down as well as uh, the, the postures that she has in her stalls as well as how she distributes herself in the barn. And so putting all that together, that's how we can evaluate how comfortable she is in that mm -hmm. environment. All right. And once we've detected behaviors, signs of discomfort, then the next question to ask ourselves is, what's going on? What's the cause of it? Yeah. yeah and, and, and so we've, we've worked through a number of those things in our first webinar and then our last webinar looking at particularly this, the lying surface of the cows. And, and today we're going to specifically look at the space and exactly. looking at how much space that cows actually have in that environment. So um, uh, as far as getting up and lying down as well as while she's actually lying in that space. Exactly. And, and so uh, today what we're going to do more specifically is look at what are the recommendations in terms of width, length, where to position the different bars. Um, also, how we can go about it and make changes in the barn and then is it profitable? It's kind of hard always to answer this question but we're, we're going to try somehow. Sounds uh, good. <laughs> all right. Anyway, that's what yeah. you're going to say. I guess I have to. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Uh, Trevor, um, oops, I'm moving backwards. Okay, the first thing we're going to do is try to look at how much space the cows need. And uh, and we, you, you've mentioned it m very many times, cows need to have enough sleep, need to lie down, a certain number of hours during the day. How much space is needed for this to happen? Well, enough? I guess I guess there's uh, there's there's not one set amount of space that a cow takes up. So we know that yes, when a cow spends time lying down, that she occupies a, a variety of different uh, areas of space. And and so the example that you have on the screen is kind of different lying postures that a cow might. Um, uh, engage in while she's lying down and so uh, it might be long in terms of taking up a, a, a more lengthy part of the stall it might be short where she's got her head back against her body uh, even a, uh, kind of against her front leg or, or her, her body it might be more wide where she's stretched out her legs are stretched out or it might be more narrow where she's a little bit tighter and in, in, um, in that stall and, and, and in all those cases, what we want is an environment that is accommodating to those different postures while she's lying down. So we want her to be able to be lying in those postures comfortably without um, either uh, having to lie next to or, 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 or right up against another cow or up against a stall component where she's going to be rubbing up against and might mm -hmm. be uh, uncomfortable. And then at the same time, we want to make sure that that lying environment, that stall dimension is designed well so that she can not only rest in that spot right. without those things, but also be able to get up and lie down. So go through the motion of actually standing up as well as lying down uh, without, again, um, complicating uh, in terms of being being hitting into bars or, or, or having pressure put against her as she's going through those motions as well. Now, I understand that we need to accommodate these very typical postures or specific behaviors, but not all cows are equal. So how do we do we go about accommodating yeah, and, all and, sizes? Yeah, and, and that's, that's I guess, a, a question that we have to ask and think about. And, and one of the things that we've, we've traditionally done is thought of uh, a lot of the older recommendations had to do with the the size of cows from a, from a weight perspective and, and right. simply had 
a lot of charts out there that classify cows based on their, their weight and saying if you've got cows of this size, they should be fit into certain stalls. And, and there's probably some element of, of um, truth or, 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 or value to that. However, we also know that cows don't all distribute their weight equally in their body size and, and they have different body sizes. And, and one of the more um, uh, probably relevant and, and, and um, validated ways of actually looking at how much cow, space cows displace is to actually look at the size of the cow herself. Um, in terms of uh, specifically, as you see on the screen here, looking at things like simply like the, the width of the cow mm -hmm. and as measured by the hip width, uh, as well as the height of the cow. So measuring again from the floor, from the standing surface to the top of that hip uh, of that cow. And, and, and we've got very good uh, studies which have looked at that, looked at the size of cows and then how yeah. that relates to, we were just talking about this before the webinar, how that relates to actually how much space a cow occupies within her stall and the amount of uh, space she actually displaces as she's getting up and lying down and, and how that relates to those to those measures. So we just take the tape, measure... Hip yeah, so we, we can measure the width and, and I think we tasked you that and we're going to talk about that, right? We, we can measure the width of the cow from the back. Um, we can measure the height. There is different tools and we have one of those tools here today. So this is Try a, not to kill me. Uh, <laughs> and hopefully you can see it. Yeah, you can see it here. So this is a basically yeah. a, a meter stick that has this uh, um, uh, horizontal bar on it that we can actually use to go up and down. We can put it on the back of the cow and use that. And, and this is one that we've, we've used a lot in research, but you could even have such a device on home. You can buy these mm -hmm. from uh, farm supply stores, actually, and you can actually get these. And, and they're quite easy to use in terms of just placing on the back. We can do it from young animals, uh, replacement heifers, all the way to our cows. We can measure basically the height, uh, and it's a simple way of just putting it on the back of the cow, on the hips, and, and putting it down until it stops. And you, you've got a good measure there of the, the height of the animals. And, and one of the reasons we're talking about this is a lot of the... Uh, recommendations that we're going to be going through today mm -hmm. are related to those two measures, so the width of the cow and, and the height of the cow specifically. Just to illustrate, I guess, how important to, it is to base our measurements on our cows as such, we have an example here of a cow uh, housed in, in a in a stall that's 48 inches wide and that has hip width of four, 25 inches and not that she's uncomfortable but we can tell that there's not very much space yeah. yeah yeah so in this case and, and we'll talk about this the the recommendation based on that size but in this case if we see uh, a 48 inch wide freestall which um, is typically regarded regarded as a freestall with a fair amount of space in the industry uh, you can see in this case even this cow is a big cow she's actually occupying that whole space and and so her our hooves on the one side are basically underneath the uh, partition, as well as on the other side, she's actually rubbing up and pushing up against the other stall divider on that side. So in this case, while she's lying down, she's actually occupying that whole space, in this, mm -hmm. in this case, of that whole 48-inch space. And, um, and, and if, if we can envision her getting up and down in that stall, it's likely that she's going to be rubbing up against that stall divider in that case as well as she, as she gets up and down. And something that we didn't mention but, but should be mentioned is the fact that um, when we think about how we design barns for cows and, and the amount of space, uh, we need to think about who our biggest cows are in a herd. Exactly. And that's, we're going to go back to the question we asked you last time, which is how big some of the biggest cows in your herd are. And, exactly. and because particularly for a freestall herd where cows can pick and choose where they want to lie down, we want to make sure that the stalls are accommodating to the majority of our largest cows yeah. in the herd. So um, either our uh, three plus lactation cows or uh, maybe the recommendation is kind of the, the at least the 75th percentile in terms of size within the farm to, to make sure we can accommodate those. We have a bit more flexibility in our tie stall barns because those in those cases, some of those barns, um, in a lot of cases, they've actually uh, sized the stalls uh, differentially across the barn, so maybe going from a little bit narrower to wider on one end of the barn down mm -hmm. to the other. And there, then we can actually uh, uh, point or, or we can put cows into stalls based on their size and right. because that's their stall. So we have a little bit more ease of, yeah. of fitting cows to the stalls in that scenario, whereas in a free stall, we have to make sure that we can accommodate all the cows and not just the average cow where... If we're just doing it for the average cow, we're going to lose out for half yeah. the cows. Right? Yeah, and as we remember from what we mentioned in the first webinar, we want 
our cows to grow older in the barn, so we better have enough space for them. Uh, so hopefully the the 30% or so of our participants today who are dairy producers had the chance to indeed measure uh, their cows as we uh, required from you uh, last week at the second webinar. So what we asked you to do, uh, first of all, we asked you, as you mentioned, to pick one of your older cows, like a third lactation cow or so, and to measure her at the hip uh, with it. So we are going to uh, launch a question for you to answer. We would like to know what you obtained as a result for your measurement. So if you are in a freestyle setting, uh, you will have to answer either the first or the second um, answer, being 47 inches and less in freestyle or 48 inches and above in freestyle. And if you are in a tie stall barn, then answer C, 53 inches and less in, in tie stall or 54 inches and above in tie stall. So we will leave you a few seconds to answer. Hopefully we will have a few <laughs> answers today. Otherwise, if you, uh, if you don't have a barn today, which is the, the situation for most of you, then the answer will be E. Or you could provide your recommendation if you if you want to as well. We so could go that way, absolutely. So whether or not you think it should be A, B, C, D, or E, depending on your preference for tie stalls or freestyles, <laughs> I guess. All right, let's go, let's go up that way. All right, so do we have answers here? All right, so 20% answered um, in freestyle, they have more than 48 inches. And 20% in tie stall answered that they have less than 53 inches. Okay. All right, that's interesting. And of course, 60% 60, 60 don't have a barn. All right, so what is the recommendation? Now, we know that we have to base our recommendations on the measurements of the cow. I think we're going to have to do some math here. Yeah, so um, one of the proposed metrics that is being advocated now is the idea of um, taking that uh, hip width measurement, uh, particularly for the width of the stalls, and, and multiplying it by some factor. And, and the factor that um, has been uh, developed particularly for uh, a freestall scenario is um, basically multiplying that by two. Simply. Uh, yeah, simply. Um, and so uh, for uh, a cow that has a hip width, say, of 24 inches, multiply that by two and we've got that 48 inch wide stall that um, is, is kind of at current probably the the, the, mo the majority of stall recommendations out there currently in the industry um, and so that's that that should provide enough space for that cow to again uh, get up and down without ease as well as not uh, be uh, rubbing herself up against those different stall components at, at that amount of space so in other words uh the stall width has to be double the width of your biggest cow or... Yeah, the, the hip width of the cow, exactly. right? Exactly. Um, and so, because we know that translates into her occupying about twice as much of that space as she's actually lying, when she's lying down, as you saw in that picture uh, previously. And as you see on the uh, slide here, uh, it mentions the fact that if, if for some reason the uh, hips of the cows don't have clearance in that stall, then we need to add some more space as well. So if we're thinking of a freestall divider in this case where we've got uh, both uh, clearance for the hips, I would say it's important actually while she's standing in the stall, so the top end of the stall, as well as in the bottom end of the stall while she's actually lying down. And so you've got that clearance while she's standing as well as while she's lying down that she can, um, again, stand there comfortably, get up and down comfortably, and then lie down without hitting stuff, at the, particularly at that ground level. And, and so you see that in, in this uh, cantilever type stall divider here where you see that. Now, that can be an issue when you've got, say, certain stall dividers where they actually have a post, say, going down into right. the ground at the back of the stall or, or even more solid type partitions. You don't see a lot of those, but there's some older style ones like that where you might not have that hip clearance. So uh, then you would need to have a wider... Yes, yeah, so you need to have a wider area for that animal to actually be lying in that area. In that All right. Case. And do we apply the same rule for both tie stalls and free stalls? Well, typically with our free st or tie stalls, we actually have a, a, a wider stall. Um, because? Uh, what's that? Because. Well, well I, <laughs> there's a number of reasons, largely because the animal is actually tied up in that, in that space okay. and, and, and is using that space a little bit differently, so they're actually moving a little bit more around in that, in that area. Um, 
they don't have they have that gutter behind them uh, in, in a lot of cases so we want a little bit more flexibility for the animal to be able to move in that case um, and 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 because she she can't step back and out as she gets up she has to be in that spot so we, we need a little bit more uh, I guess total square footage in that stall for that animal to to get up and down in and so the recommendation there is typically the twice that hip width plus another six inches uh, of space uh, in that case so like about another 15 centimeters of space and then again the same thing if we don't have that clearance uh, for the cows so if we've got some kind of solid divider or dividers that are going straight down into the ground which are again going to interfere with that cow uh, as she's either getting up or down or as she's lying down in that stall we're going to see the same uh, have need, need for a little yeah. bit more width in terms of that stall. All right. We've asked our participants uh, to tell us just before uh, what the width of their stalls. Now, I think it would be interesting to go through because we've asked them to measure their cows. So I think it would be interesting to see how the width of their stall fits with their cows. So um, we're providing you here on the next slide with a table. We, we made the calculation with for yeah. you. So basically the, the doubling as we just mentioned, the doubling for the free stall and for the for the hip width and then uh, for the tie stall the same thing plus that extra six inches of space. Exactly. So you'll look at the first line, you will you will um, find what's the hip width that you found on your cow and then uh, refer to whatever type of, st of stall you have for be it free stall or tie stall and find what should be the recommendation. Now the question that we will ask you is are your stalls narrower than the recommendation that we've calculated? Is it as recommended or is it larger than? Uh, we'll leave you a few seconds to answer this now. So what do you think? And in, in, in a general way, you said you've been measuring well, lots of cows. I, I would say it's highly barn dependent. So of course, yeah. So um, on general, from a lot of the surveys we've done recently, uh, I would say it's getting close to recommended in a lot of cases. Uh, but you Good. see a lot of variability. So some people it's actually very large stalls, and then some people it's still quite very yeah. And, and our cows keep growing, yeah. right? We've got better and better genetics, but our barns, uh, not always, right? Yeah. So uh, the results obtained, uh, most people, 80%, have stalls uh, as recommended, with dimensions as recommended, and uh, one out of five, I would say, has narrow, is narrower than the recommendations, but something that fits with what we observe. Okay, all right. Uh, now, if we, uh, for, like for these 17%, if the... You know, if they decided that they wanted to get their stalls larger, is it easy to go about it? I'm well, expecting that the answer is not yet. Oh well, no, it's <laughs> it's going to be yeah. It's it's there's going to be very difficulties in trying to enlarge stalls again, depending on um, the the setup of the facility right. and and often it's. Uh, um, Obviously, if we're planning new facilities, it's much easier for us to, to plan where posts are going to go, where we're going to lag down individual stall bases, and, and whether that be in a free stall or a tie stall. Uh, however, to retrofit uh, existing facilities, whether that be tie stalls or free stalls, uh, it becomes much less flexible because there's often impediments to making those right. changes in, in those barns. And so we need to think a little bit, sometimes a little bit outside the box, and think about uh, alternative ways of, of, say, modifying those those areas and might involve not just uh, moving a divider over but also moving some other components of, the, of that stall to, mm -hmm. to accommodate uh, that change in that case. Uh, before we go on to an example of a barn where they made a modification, I think it would be interesting if our participants shared with us if they had to uh, go about enlarging their stalls, or uh, if you don't have a barn, uh, think of your clients. What are obstacles or constraints that you have that makes it difficult for you to think of enlarging the stalls? I think it will be interesting for our discussion after. So uh, we have an example here of two cows that really like <laughs> each other. Yeah, so so this is a, a tie stall setup where we've got two cows that uh, look nice and snug. And I, I heard Steve's comment from yesterday was that these these cows are actually spooning each other. So exactly. uh, I think that's a good description of that. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. You, you were talking about positions yeah, uh, yeah. for rest. That's another one. So, <laughs> it wasn't on the slide. 
<laughs> so in this case, it, it's a good example where, yeah, we've got stalls that are likely too narrow, um, and, and you've got these cows that basically have to be uh, lying nearly on top of each other in this case. <laughs> uh, big cows, not enough space. In this case, uh, I don't see a divider there either uh, that's going to separate them, uh, which in some cases, uh, if again, if you don't have enough space, that might actually be a better option not to have that divider because it's... If it's a divider and she's squeezed into that, that's going to really limit her. But yes. the other alternative is without there, she's going to also be right up against that yeah. other Not cow. Not to mention so. the, the chain length here. but yeah. it's So that's the other thing you can see just yeah. from the picture is that, yeah. t that chain is tight as she's got her head down. Uh, and if, if you can imagine the cow having her head back, uh, then exactly. there's even less uh, availability for her to lie in that posture. So difficult there. So I think in this case, the producers took a look at this and, and, and made some decisions in terms of what they were going yeah. to do. So actually uh, remove the, the current um, uh, uh, basically uh, set up, set up uh, yeah. in terms of the neck rail and, and put in actual dividers between the cows and, and set up actually in this case uh, without a fixed neck rail. They actually had a chain, chain rail basically, so a chain oh, yeah. and yeah. then attach the, the chains there. Um, uh, so, so how much space do they have now compared to before? I think they added, uh, I, I actually, I'm, I'm trying to remember what it was, but I think it was um, 46 inches 46 per inches, cow? and they went up to yeah. 52 or something like exactly. that. Exactly. So, yeah, so, so they added about a half foot, which is a considerable amount of space. And, and even that 52, uh, as you saw in the previous slide, is, is actually less than a lot yes. of kind of our recommendations for tie stall widths. Nevertheless, um, did it? improve the situation? Well, they saw, they saw uh, themselves an increase in, in kind of how much time they actually saw a cow was lying down in those stalls. And yeah, because this farm was part of a project. I, this farm yeah. was part of a project, so they, they were able to measure. Yeah, and I think they saw close to an hour worth of, wow. uh, about three quarters of an hour worth of extra lying time in the cows after they had transitioned to, to the new, new setup in this case. And, and with very, a tremendous cost? Very pleased. Um, again, I think it was... There's a cost to it. I think about $7,500 that it cost them to uh, make that uh, change in that barn. So again, something it was an investment that they had to make, but yes. they realized before they made that change that it was really something that was impeding the, the health and performance of their cows. And what I noticed from this picture here, the situation is far from perfect, but in your opinion, was it worth... Yeah, I would say for sure. And and again, there's still things that, that are aren't uh, ideal in this in this setup. Uh, the chain length maybe still a little bit short, and uh, the curb at the front of the stall is still a little bit high, but uh, still a good uh, or much improved over the previous uh, setup that they had in that scenario. All right. So I don't think we have any comments or. or um obstacles or constraints from the participants, but I think from our experience we can go through uh, several uh, several things that we've observed uh, in different barns. What, what are those obstacles that we may or may not go around? Well, around? I, guess, I guess I've already mentioned a number of those. Yeah. So, so the actual physical design, so if we've got posts in a, in a facility, right? right, that are spaced at a yes. certain spacing, and, and that's what we're building or, or anchoring our stalls to, whether again that's in a free stall or a tie stall setup, that's going to actually dictate where we where we uh, place stalls and and, right. and the and the width in front of them, or sorry the width that we might get out of those stalls. Other things like in a tie stall, the placement of things like uh, water lines, uh, right. milk lines, those those can all play a role in that. And if we think about having to widen those stalls, we might have to actually physically move those the setup of those within the barn as well. Um, other things like uh, the width of the feeding alley in front, uh, we'll come back to this later when we talk about the position of the neck rail, but if they don't have space to start making modifications and actually putting things in, they might not be able to okay. do that. Um, we do have someone that has a comment question. Yes, it's uh, Marina. She had the, the question, are the green stalls more recommended? And what would be the, the white What would be the width? Yeah. Yeah. Recommended. Yeah. So the so the green stalls, which we're seeing in freestyle barns now, um, are they recommended? Uh, I guess I guess it really depends on your um, willingness to manage those. In my in my opinion, um, uh, there's not a lot of really there. Are, there's not enough in the industry that we've seen them included in a lot of our uh, survey type studies that we've done, where we've got good uh, results on those. Um, but I guess from an anecdotal standpoint. 
Um, I, I see them working well uh, in terms of, again, uh, limiting the amount of hardware. And so that's something, I guess, that's a take home that I would just say in general, that the more hardware we put around of cows, the more hard it becomes for the cow to get up and down. So yeah. the more metal there is, the right, the more difficult. So the idea behind the green uh, free stalls is to, to limit the amount of basically hardware and, and keep it quite simple for the animal, basically just providing a guide for that animal to lie down and, and get up and down. Um, the difficulty with that becomes is that as you limit that, you also increase the flexibility in terms of, they're not only flexible, but the flexibility in terms of the cow in terms of her use of that. And so you may see certain cows not using those stalls properly, lying uh, more diagonals, uh, um, dirtying those stalls a little bit more. And, and so that's what I've heard from producers that have used it, that they do require a little bit more maintenance from, from the stall perspective. So again, and, and we'll come back to that. We, if we make a stall bigger, it's going to get used more or make uh, the space more available to the animal, it's going to get used more, it's going to get dirty quicker. And so they, they, those stalls will require more maintenance in that case as well. Um, there has been a tendency, and this is where I, I, I caution, is that uh, producers, to avoid that, they actually set those stalls a little narrower. narrower. Right. And, and so uh, I've heard recommendations of actually going away from the wider stalls that we've recommended in the past, actually going down to you know, like a 46-inch wide mm -hmm. Uh, space for the for the green stalls for our Holstein cows, and and that becomes difficult then because it's yeah their idea there is yeah they because they're flexible they 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 want to prevent those cows from lying diagonally and, and being too much but the problem with that is it becomes harder than for that cow to get up and down and we see more of that rubbing and 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 contact with the stalls themselves in that scenario so that's the caution I would say that we we. I would recommend against going again narrower with those stalls, keeping them at our recommended widths, but then re realize that we're going to have to maintain those stalls maybe right. a little bit more in that scenario. Because I guess the, the, even if you get narrower, the cow becomes, like the, the neighbor cow basically still is as yeah. wide as yeah. she is. Yeah, yeah. Actually, I heard a good anecdote in that case. And, and one, of the, one of the things that we could actually do is, um, in that case would be fine to not only, you could narrow the stall, but then you'd almost want a buffer zone between adjacent stalls. And, and uh, obviously nobody wants to do that because that well. seems like a big waste of space in the yeah. barn, but, but it's really that. Like we could probably get away with having that stall divider a little bit closer if there was actually six inches between each stall divider or something like that, but that mm -hmm. just doesn't make no. sense from a space standpoint. You're talking about losing space or wasting space. Um, Indeed, if and let's go quickly over this question, but if you do enlarge your stalls, then you may fear that you're not going to have enough stalls for your cows anymore. Well, yeah, you will. You, you will lose stalls in your barn, exactly. right, so in, in, that, in that design as well, or sort of with that kind of um, retrofit. So, again, whether, again, a tie stall, free stall, if, if we're going to put wider stalls in a set amount of space, we're going to end up having to eventually potentially lose a stall space along that line. And, the question is, how many does it lose, and, and do we need all those in that case, right? Maybe um, with improved comfort, we might actually milk one less cow, right? I, I, it's hard to predict that. Right. Um, I think we'll come to something of a prediction yeah. in a few moments on that, but um, but we need to make sure that, yeah, we we've, we've uh, uh, think about that when we're doing these things, that we're still keeping proper amounts of numbers of stalls for cows as well. Let's try to see indeed if it's worth enlarging the stalls and uh, we often uh, think about our lactating cows, lactating cows, but let's start to look at the well, impact guess, on... Yeah, on so, so we have a few examples. The first one is um, data... Oh, <laughs> oh, oh no, okay. here we go. There. <laughs> so this is data actually from, from Deborah uh, Sanchi from uh, Velacta where uh, as part of a study on 48 herds in, in Quebec, uh, what she looked at was applying the transition cow index, which is a um, is an index that was created by the University of Wisconsin that's been adopted by throughout the uh, dairy industry as a way of basically evaluating particular transition cow programs. So yeah. inputting a whole bunch of metrics um, into that uh, surrounding the, the, the management of, of transition cows from housing to uh, health and nutrition to production outcomes, and looking at the basically based on all those inputs, looking at the predicted uh, benefit uh, for, from a cow perspective, where basically uh, the more positive is the, the greater the 
the production and profitability uh, uh, potential of that animal. And what you saw in the study when, when she applied that index to these uh, 48 herds that she was looking at, uh, what she saw is that basically it wasn't until we basically got to the uh, widest stalls in this case. Um, yeah, I'm, it's trying, very I'm trying to read the number. If you can't it. see it on the screen, probably you might not see it, but it's the, the final bar, the black bar there, we're looking uh, at greater than 50 exactly. inches in width. <laughs> Um, and these are uh, mostly tie stalls uh, in this case. Um, yeah. yeah, in this in this study where they saw the greatest basically uh, production uh, potential or or, or positive uh, in this case. Um, so again, suggesting that from a modeling standpoint, we sh we should be able to reap uh, production benefits uh, or an improvement in transition cow health and production benefits right. uh, by simply having wider stalls. Okay, um, so this is for, for uh, dry cows. Now let's look at lactating cows, the impact of Yeah, so, so we've got a number of other studies that have looked at this, and, and just two examples on the screen, one uh, newer result coming out of our cluster project and one older result from um, uh, Dr. Cassandra Tucker from, from her PhD work at UBC a number of years ago where basically, she, uh, and, and I'll flip to that on the first side, so what she looked at was simply looking at different stall widths, and what she found was that basically, particularly in this this case, between a, um, a, uh, a 44 and a 48 inch wide mm -hmm. free stall, she found an improvement in, in close to an hour, about, or three quarters of an hour of resting time right. in those cows. So again, getting cows off their feet, off hard concrete floors or whatever it might be in this case, and these are in free stalls, and, and, and increasing the amount of time that they're able to spend lying down. Uh, other work uh, out of the cluster now showing similarly looking at again across the spectrum of farms, so uh, looking at the uh, particularly how stall size in, in cows ending their first and second lactations, their mm -hmm. risk of being called in subsequent lactations. And there's basically for every four inch increase in a space across that spectrum, they saw a decrease in culling risk in those animals. So again, good examples where we're seeing not only a change in the behavior of the animals in relation to the uh, stall size, but then a, a productive or in this case, a health related outcome. Uh, in that case, and I think we have one more example on the next slide yeah, as well. Yeah, brand new. That it's new, just, new, just for uh, well, new data. Uh, that's that's just going to be published very very soon. So this is uh, work again out of the original cluster project, uh, as well as some additional data actually. So these are data from robotic farms or automated milking farms in Canada, as well as actually there's a, a few from the U.S. thrown in there for good measure as well. <laughs> and in this case, um, uh, what we did in this analysis was actually look at on these farms, uh, whether or not cows fit their stall width, as per this metric, metric that we've been using. So for free stalls, whether or not simply the average uh, cow on the farm fit the stall width, which was in our term uh, twice the hip width again. Right. And and so what they what they found in or in this analysis was that basically for primiparous, which was even stronger than multiparous cows, mm -hmm. um, the odds I think of the odds in the case of the primiparous cows was close to four times odds. Of, of being lame, uh, and, and the multiparous is about 1.3, 1.4 times odds of being lame when they didn't fit in their stall. So again, it, it kind of all these things are making sense together, right? If right. you got stalls that are too narrow, the cows aren't going to want to lie right. down in them. They're standing more, they're resting less, right? They're forcing them to stand more, and we see, a, again, increased culling risk, as we showed you in this case now, a greater risk of, of lameness, uh, clinical lameness in these cows as well. All right. Now let's try to put this into dollars, into yeah. numbers. Uh, we let's pretend that uh, this farm, the coast to coast farm, which basically represents the average farm uh, in Canada. Let's pretend that they want to enlarge their stall. So basically, the average farm will be 84 kilos of fat in terms of quota, about 9,000 uh, kilos per cow. We we know we know the numbers basically. So let's let's pretend. This is, is this a tie stall, free stall fa farm in this case? Whatever. Okay. Yeah. It's we're a look, farm. We're looking at Steve because he's the one that actually <laughs> put, put the numbers together for this. But we can say, let's just say uh, in this case, because I think the numbers are conducive to a, a tie stall because they, they're looking at a significant increase in their stall width in this case. So Of six inches. Yeah, of six inches, right? Yeah. And, and so basically using some of the metrics we, we've talked about, thinking about 
um, improvements in rest time, the potential improvements in production we might get with that, decreases in things like lameness, uh, decreases in culling risk, the, the so increase in resting time. Increased resting time, as I mentioned, um, the potential to gain a little bit more production per cow, potentially save on some of the culling. So keeping some of those older cows around, um, having a little bit lower culling rate, right? A little uh, older uh, uh, average lactation herd or average parity herd. Um, uh, we're going to um, potentially, at a cost of about $24,000, a, a capital cost, uh, save, uh, and I think the, the number on the bottom there is, um, if we can get it to come up. Um, it's coming. I think it's traveling across Canada before uh, it gets on the slide. Anyway, let's, it's, it's 16,000. It. No, it's, it's, no, it's not. No, it's I don't not have that the right version. No, no. I, I don't have the updated version. So, oh, there you're you go. Being, you're being optimistic. Yeah, it's about $11,000 yeah, yeah. per year <laughs> investment. Um, uh, one of the challenges, and I, I forgot to ask Steve this, so, but again, we see that the, in this case, you'd be losing places in the barn, so exactly. we have to account for that loss in, in, in spots. And we're pretending so. here that we're going to have more production to compensate so we can call yeah. from cows. Yeah. That it, right. Okay, yeah. all right. Now, we talked a, a lot about widows, and we think it's very important, but nevertheless, it's not always easy to go about enlarging. So... The, the compromise that we can make sometimes is, is improving other things in yeah. terms of space. And it's, so and, and, yeah, and, and as we talked about last time, we need to make sure everything's good for the cow. We can't just focus on one area exactly. and pretend like everything else is, is fine. The so uh, the other aspect that we need to consider is the, the length of the stall as well, so, which is just as equally important for that cow as the width of the stall. So, again, I'm assuming here that we're basing our recommendations on the size of the cow. So what measurement are we going to base our recommendations? Oh, it's not moving again, the slides. Oh, oh, it's maybe just a connection. It's magic. Here. Magic. Yeah. Oh, okay, so we lost internet. Okay, so hopefully everybody hopefully still with still us. There. <laughs> you don't have to pack up and move. <laughs> All right. So, okay. yeah, so same thing. So uh, as with stall width, uh, where we looked at the hip width of the cows, uh, for the, the length of the stalls, we can actually look to the other metric which we described, which is actually the hip height of the cow. And so we can look at how high the cow stands and actually use that. And, and what you have then is in the guide, actually, um, uh, so the guide that you have, um, as, you, as you've seen before and as you can download uh, online uh, at the Dairy Knowledge website, is uh, basically, as you see on page uh, 16 and 17, different metrics for um, uh, how length, long, sorry, the, those stalls should be relative again to the uh, to the height of the cows. And right. and one of the one of the challenges that we have, and and tie stalls are a little bit easier because there's maybe a little bit less variability. We we have a row of stalls, and, and so it's a little bit easier. So we have this metric of of uh, in this case uh, 1.2 times the the hip height, as you see on the on the right side. Whereas uh, free stalls, we there's there's a number of different things that we can or different uh, designs of barns that have to be taken into account. So you've got some free stalls that are uh, maybe just go back a slide. Sorry, some free stalls that are uh, will go on the bottom like head to head scenario. So right. we're going to actually be looking at a shorter distance or a slightly shorter distance from that that individual stall to the middle point of those two, right? right. Um, because you can basically some of the space in between those stalls is is usable by animals on both sides, whereas if you've got a wall in front of the animals, as you see in the top, you're going to be looking at a larger space yeah. uh, uh, that's required. So in that case, we're talking twice tw yes. uh, twice the length in, in, in that scenario as well. And then we also have to think about the usable space of the stall, which is that uh, space from basically the back of the curb to the uh, the brisket board uh, in this case. So so here's the example, as you see on the screen, the, the example of a free stall where we're looking at twice the length. So if we're looking at a stall that's a single row of stalls up against a wall, uh, or a fence or something like that uh, in the barn or a gate, uh, we're looking at uh, ideally about twice the hip height uh, length from the back of the stall right up to that 
farthest point in front of the animal where they might displace as they as they lunge and get up mm -hmm. and down in that stall. Mm -hmm. And so that's really what that's, that's getting uh, to in that scenario. Whereas in a tie stall setting, as you've mentioned already, the factor instead of being two will be 1.2. Yeah, it, but it's, yeah, and it's measuring, and we could apply that same factor actually to the free stall in terms of that space from, again, like I said, exactly. the curb to the brisket board. In this case, we're looking at how much space she's using in that stall there. Again, with the assumption that there's lots of lunge space in front of the cow. Indeed. Right? So if there wasn't any, right? So it could be problematic as well. We, we want to think about that space from the, um, the curb or from the divider there as well forward in that tie stall scenario as well to make sure that we have enough lunge space in front of that cow. Right. Uh, for her to get up and down as well, but but this would be the kind of the typical metric that we would use in that case for determining the bed length in particular for right. that tie stall. Okay, now let's go see um, what's the length of the stalls in the barns of our participants. Um, we asked you to measure the hip length, uh, not the hip length, the hip height. height. Sorry, <laughs> to uh, and, and that was to be in order to check if the length of your stall is appropriate. So again, we made the calculations for you. So basically, uh, if your the hip height of your cow that you've measured is 57, 58, whatever, up to 61, uh, compare it to uh, whether you're in a free stall or a tie stall setting. We put it in the in feet and inches for free stall and, and just inches Yeah, and this is, again, stall. for a tie stall, this is um, obviously the bed length, right, from the back of the stall Absolutely. to the curb. And for a free stall, this is the recommendation for basically a single row of stalls. So, yes. so from basically the back of that stall to whatever wall yeah. or space is in front of that stall. Yeah. If, if, you've got a, if you've got a two row barn with head to head stalls or even a three row barn where you've got a, one row with head to head stalls, then uh, it would actually be, uh, it'd be less in that case. And, and the number, sorry, I'm, I'm, uh, we don't have those numbers calculated for you, but no. they, they, the multiplier there is, uh, sorry, one, 1.8. 1.8 from yes. the back of the stall to the middle of those two stalls. All right. Yeah. Now, um, we're going to ask you the question, are your stalls longer than the recommendation for your cows, shorter, or as recommended? So we'll wait for your answers. Are we having uh, any answers coming in? Yes. All right. Pretty neat that answers are coming from different places yeah. across the country. All right, so 14% are longer than recommended, and 29% are shorter, 57% as recommended. So there's variability. Yeah. Uh, in some cases, there might be some improvement to make, uh, but let's see how we can go about it, if we can go about it. <laughs> uh, all right. now. We've seen that a larger space is has advantages for the cow. What about a longer space? Well, I guess it would be the same in that we know that um, similar to providing more width to a stall, if we were going to expand the length, uh, we typically have seen in, in studies, we've seen more usage of that stall. Um, uh, not only from actually a lying perspective, but also a standing perspective. We see kind of spending more time standing with all four feet in those stalls, um, but also spending more time lying down. And this is, again, uh, some data, some some older data already that we, we've done yeah. over 10 years ago, looking at uh, basically how much time cows are willing to spend uh, lying down, depending on stall length. Again, two uh, fairly extreme, I guess, differences in this case, so 89 inches, so we're looking at um, just over seven, almost seven and a half feet uh, mm -hmm. versus uh, just under 11 feet uh, of space uh, in this case, uh, my multiplying that right. Yeah, just sorry, just under nine feet. Sorry, nine. <laughs> right, okay. Yeah, 108 inches would be uh, uh, nine feet, right? Um, so we're looking at yeah, just under nine. So in this case, you're seeing a difference in terms of uh, lying time between those two yeah. scenarios, um, uh, particularly at the narrower stall width, right? So if you've got a very narrow stall width, uh, even a more pronounced difference in terms of the amount of uh, extra lying time, and then. Mm -hmm. But even even at a wide stall, we're still seeing uh, that improvement in, yeah. in lying time with the 
So for the sake of our participants here, we're comparing one the brown bar with the brown bar and the blue bar with yeah, the blue bar. Yeah, well, yeah, within each uh, stall width. Category. Exactly, yeah. exactly. So there's an improvement in terms of uh, resting time. Uh, that's what we're looking at. Yeah, resting time. Yeah. <laughs> if if the if the stall is longer, that's pretty much what we're we're observing here. Uh, okay. And now going back to our dye, uh, to our well, yeah, dry gauss, sorry. Uh, again, I think we've observed the same trend. Yeah, so trend. It's, it's the same. So Deborah saw the same thing in her study with the, the herds in Quebec, the 48 herds, where she saw again when she applied uh, the transition cow index to those herds and, and, and collected all the information and put it into the model that she basically saw the same uh, response that we saw with. Uh, stall width, so, which was that basically as stalls got uh, or were longer, I should say, um, the, the predicted uh, benefit from, from a cow production standpoint and, and uh, performance through early lactation uh, was much improved. So you see this uh, curvilinear increase basically yeah. in, uh, yeah. in potential as, as we go to a wider or sorry, a longer stall in this case, as we saw with the wider stall. Is it easier to think of uh, increasing the length of a stall than enlarging it? How can we go about it? Yeah, I think I think there's in some ways we have a few more options in terms of uh, lengthening stalls than we do in terms of changing the width. Again, the width we might run into that uh, opportunity or that opportunity, but that situation where we're going to lose stalls because we've only right. got so much width in On the barn to deal with. However. We can think about a, a short stall, uh, whether again that's a free stall or a tie stall, we can think about different things that we can do to uh, give that cow more space in that scenario, whether or not it's adding some space to the, at the end of the stall, so the back curb, or potentially increasing the amount of space at the front end of the stall, opening that up more as well, and or pushing stall components maybe forward a little bit to get a bit more space out of that stall. But then if you increase, like on this on this picture that we see on the screen here, if you increase by the back of the stall, I guess you have to have enough width of in the alley or make yeah, sure it depends, that Yeah, it depends what system, again, so it's hard to be prescriptive, so I don't want to, right? But you, yeah, you might have, if you've got a scraper system or something behind that, so you'd have to account for that and, and take that into account. And again, those things, I'd say, are probably more adjustable than than the actual stall itself. So if we make that decision to go there, we can mm -hmm. probably accommodate those other kinds of things uh, more easily than actually changing the length of the stall itself. I find that dairy producers are often very creative and find interesting solutions. We have a few examples yeah. so, to show. So us. again, every every barn is going to be different and, yeah. and every potential solution is going to be different for every barn, but we're just, uh, we're just going to throw up a few examples of pictures that, that we've collected which have show different different ideas and again it may be a little bit difficult to see in this case but we've got a, a tie stall here where um, to lengthen the bed length of the stall you see the post basically if, I, if you focus on the the front post yes. uh, kind of in line with just in front of the the front legs of the cows behind the neck of the cows that would be the original spot where the the what we say the manger curb was previously and and so that was from there to the back of the stall was the length of the stall and this producer wanted to lengthen out that stall a little bit so um, you see some of the feed spilling over onto the the feed side, but really the the feed bunk should start uh, uh, to the to the um, uh, to the right of that in this case. Uh, so where the cow's muzzle is there, and so you actually see that they built out that manger curb, uh, extended it by um, about ten inches. It looks like. Um, uh, to give that cow a bit more space in that stall to lie down in. And at the same time, and we'll come back to the neck rail later, but you see that they've pushed the neck rail out yes. as well because the neck rail was originally uh, in line with that, that single post, that's uh, the vertical post there as well. And so for, to accommodate the standing behavior and the eating behavior of the cow in that stall, they had to push that neck rail forward in that case as well. Would you be scared that the cow moves too much forward? In this case, well, no, it's going to depend on that on that position of that neck rail in that case. And so, if, it, if uh, we can't see the back of the stall, but if it's a really short stall, then uh, likely that cow, the backside of that cow, is right at the the, at the, the gutter end. anyway. So, yeah. okay. um, I'm not too worried. <laughs> Perfect. All right. Now, another example where they went about increasing the length at the end or at the back of yeah, the Yeah, so this stall. is a free stall example where simply by they, they recognized that they had a short stall and, and so they 
um, wanted to extend the length of the cell, so they basically put a plate down, right? So a metal, in this case, it's a metal plate that's sitting uh, at the back of the stall. So again, extending it out about six inches, I think in this case, six to eight inches uh, from the back of the stall. And then um, it's hard to again see, but there's a mattress there that's kind of laying on top there. So again, this is this was a, a, a good way of, 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 without adding concrete and things, is, is mm -hmm. putting something there that, Again, manure could be scraped underneath, potentially exactly. the, yeah. the, the scraper blade could probably, if it's an automated scraper system, could fit underneath, so uh, work works quite well. The only challenge with this is to make sure that, that in this case, that whatever we've added is not going to be tough on the legs of the cow, so not abrasive, right? So uh, in this case, extending, say, if there was a mattress, making sure the mattress is there and making sure that we can keep bedding on there as well, making sure surfaces are smooth and rounded off so that Again, we're not going to create any any abrasion, mm -hmm. and we we're we're not going to have a, a tough surface for that cow right. to lie down on in that case. Sometimes you cannot increase the length of the stall from the front because there's a wall, so you just push the wall. Yeah. Well. <laughs> yeah. So so in some cases, I've actually seen producers uh, where they've been willing to do that. Yeah. Um, actually um, move a wall completely. Yeah, uh, the, the, the picture you see here is a, uh, where they've actually pushed out just a portion of the wall. Um, so they've actually, the posts, you can see the structural post of the barn is still there. However, they've actually moved part of that wall out so that you've got a little bit more lunge space for that cow. So they basically just kind of cut out the side of the wall, uh, moved it out a bit so that they could they could create a little bit more space at, at, the, at the headroom of the cow. Um, I, I should have put a picture in this presentation, but I've got a great picture of a freestall barn where they had uh, stalls that were too short, and they had netting, uh, basically bird netting at the side of the stalls. And you could actually see in every stall where the cows had gone through the netting as they lunged up and down. And so that's a real clear example yeah. in my case that the cows don't have enough space in front of them, right? And and you see it in barns like this where you've got a solid wall, you'll actually, actually see scuffing and you'll see marking against the wall where you, uh, so again, uh, it doesn't take a rocket scientist in those cases to notice that cows are having a difficult time getting up and down. If you actually see signs of, in the case of broken netting or in, in the case of scuffing on a wall, where you actually see signs of cows hitting that wall, mm -hmm. getting up and down. And, and so in this case, the producer wanted to really get some more length, so they actually pushed that wall out mm -hmm. to, to be able to get that length on the stalls. I actually have another example of a farm near my house where they actually opened the wall and rebuilt one further too and you can see now the cows uh, getting up or lying down and you see the head going over the line on the concrete <laughs> where the wall used to be and uh, you can tell that you know they weren't able to do their full move before before then. Um, sometimes also the length is, is um, it's blocked by the, the manger curb. Yeah, so in a tie stall, so again, back to a tie stall example, um, the next picture we have is uh, a stall where the manger curb was basically uh, built too high. And, and, and uh, if sometimes... What's, what's the recommendation for the high? Well, so, so the recommendation would be about, uh, about 8 inches. Uh, okay. um, I would say anywhere from 6 to 8 inches uh, from the stall surface of the cow in the case of a tie stall. And then we want that height differential as well from the manger itself. So we want that manger to be at least about four inches different from the uh, stall surface as well to create that difference in height. Um, in this case, the, the, the manger was too high. So they actually cut out a few inches of concrete uh, to actually bring that down to, again. So to provide more lunge space for that cow, make it more natural as she's lying there as well. She doesn't have something right up against her neck as she's lying down and then even getting up and down, the, there's more space for her in that scenario. That's very interesting. Uh, one last example quickly. In this case here, uh, you can see that the structure of the stall had a, a pipe or at the bottom of the yeah. stall. Yeah. yeah, so this is a, a free stall where we, we see the, the stall divider uh, suspended stall divider where it's hung basically off uh, a top rail and a bottom rail uh, at the front of the stall. And 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 again, um, we've changed a lot of our free stalls or a lot of the new installations are, are into single post installations where we don't have to have that bottom uh, basic uh, rail to attach to. And so in this case, that rail is again right at the kind of the face level of the cow as she's lying down and, and also is going to potentially impede her as she's getting up and down in that stall. Yep. And, and particularly when she does that lunge, lunge you remember her, her head moving down and up, right? And so when she does that, with that potentially that rail might be 
in in her way in that case. Right. And, and so. So what they um, do because they didn't want to remove any solidity to the stall. Yeah. So so in this case, yeah, you you need to anchor that that stall divider down somehow. So they actually remove that bottom rail and then actually just put down single um, uh, post basically or, or legged. Uh, little uh, 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 pieces that they could attach the divider onto, and so they could basically attach the stall divider onto those, and then those lag down into the ground. So again, basically eliminating that that um, uh, bar that was sitting in front of the cow. So again, a good a good retrofit here, uh, and, and an easy one to really open up more space for those cows. And you can see a, a picture of that barn here, where now that front of that stall, there's a lot more space in front of those cows. Uh, uh, for those cows to, to be lying there comfortably as well as to get up and down comfortably in that okay. scenario. All right. Now let's move on to the bars. Um, there are many bars around our cows in barns. So what bars uh, are we talking about that can create discomfort or prevent cows from expressing their well, yeah, and, and, and so um, part of any stalls, whether it's, again, a tie stall or a free stall, we see different types of bars. So the one, as you see in the picture here, uh, one that's very typical in a tie stall would be the actual uh, neck rail or, or the chain attachment rail. And, and, and often this doubles as, uh, or in many cases, they, there might be a water line running through that. And so that's often another complicating factor if we ever want to move things, right? Uh, mm -hmm. and, and so... Um, uh, sometimes we'll have, as we showed you earlier, we'll talk about that you might replace that or it might be replaced with a, with a more flexible system like a chain, but, but often we have those neck rails in place in, in tie stall facilities. We have, uh, in freestall barns, we have uh, other types of bars. So we have a, typically a neck rail in a freestall itself where, again, um, it's going to be used to index the position of the cow in that stall, and we'll come back to and talk, to, yeah. talk about it in a minute. And then we might also have a, a rail, like the, the neck rail at the feed bunk as well. And so mm -hmm. that's another source. And we talked about that actually in the first one as well. The, when we talked about neck injuries, neck that, injuries that, yeah. in freestyle barns, that neck rail at the feed bunk can be just as much a source of neck injuries as can the, the neck rail in, in the stall itself. And so anytime, and, and I guess the take home is in any of those situations, any pressure that those uh, bars or, or rails can um, exert sure. on the cow are going to have a negative impact. So not only increased rubbing, friction, hair loss, potential causes, causes of lesions and injuries, uh, but also potentially impeding, particularly at the stalls, right, impeding the ability of the cow to get up and down okay. and, and, and so causing them to uh, engage in kind of abnormal standing and lying behavior okay. uh, in their stalls. Now, in terms of recommendations, uh, I guess we won't go into the details of each here. Uh, we're we're going to direct the participants to, again, page 16 and 17 uh, of uh, the guide for recommendations. But if we go, uh, I guess there are two, two things that we have to look at. Yeah, really, really the, the height of that neck rail yeah. and then the position, the forward position of that uh, within the stall as well. So in a tie stall setting here, uh, Speaking about the advancement, what's the recommendation? So, so typically, as you see in the screen here, the, the or I guess the, the recommendation that's uh, being proposed is um, similar to looking at the length of the stall. So, looking at that uh, factor of 1.2 times the hip height. So, looking at the hip height of the cow again, and and then adding some level of increase beyond basically that manger curve, right? So mm -hmm. we're thinking of that 1.2 times the hip height as being the length of the platform or the bed for the cow, and then adding uh, a certain amount more space in front of that uh, for the position of the neck rail. So ideally, um, in a lot of tie stall barns, we still see neck rails positioned right over top of that manger curb. In an ideal scenario, uh, that neck rail is actually uh, positioned forward to that. So uh, push forward uh, away from the mm. um, uh, the actual uh, curb. Uh, okay. In this in, in this case, we're saying about 14 inches forward would be ideal uh, in that scenario. Okay. What about the height? And then the height uh, again, uh, a little bit uh, variability there, um, uh, but the recommendation is about 0. 0.7 to 0. 0.8 times that hip height again uh, uh, from a recommended height perspective. Um, I guess one thing to, and, and, and we'll show in some examples, but one thing to keep in mind is that those two interplay. It's, it's kind of like, I say the same with a freestall feed bunk and neck rail. 
uh, basically we can get away with a higher neck rail if it's a little bit back or or we can get away with a little bit lower neck rail if it's pushed a little bit forward. And so the, the two have to work together. These are kind of the ideal scenarios. Yeah. And, and uh, we'll talk about that with the freestall as well, that those are where we might want to start and think right. And then in an ideal world, especially if we're thinking about building new facilities, we want things as flexible as possible. So think about uh, being able to adjust those uh, as well, which would be ideal in a lot of, in, in say, new newer facilities where, we have that option mm -hmm. would, be, would be great to be able to do if you have to make a compromise a compromise sorry um would you prioritize advancing the bar or putting it higher um i'd say you'd want to look at both uh some of the data again uh that we have would suggest that um maybe moving the bar forward might be even more important um and so this is data again from our cluster project where we show that Moving the bar forward actually was associated with uh, decreased injuries and lameness in cows. So what you see here is in the darker line is basically um, uh, all cows, and then the blue line is cows where their bar was actually pushed forward by about 35 centimeters. So we're looking at about uh, uh, 13 inches kind of forward. So that 13, 14 inches actually forward from the um, uh, from the manger curve, and and in that case we see decreased uh, neck injuries, but also leg leg injuries, so mm -hmm. knee injuries, as well as lameness in those cows. So again, signaling a more comfortable environment for those cows in that case. Um, so these results here suggest that the advancement of the barn is particularly important. Yeah, yeah, in this case, uh, and again, it might be uh, the fact that there is little variability in actual the, the height of the barn, right? And, and so again, gotcha. uh, yeah. I urge okay. producers to look at both those factors in that case as well. All right, all right. So what can be the obstacles for a dairy producer to uh, putting the bar higher or more moving it forward? Well, I guess it's the same kind of thing that we talked about with, with any types of uh, changes is what, what physical structures are there in place that are going to impede the movement of that, right? So uh, whether or not there's, again, posts in the barn, whether or not there's um, other things like milk lines, whether or not uh, water lines, like I mentioned before, how much space we actually have in front of those cows. Uh, so if we need to uh, move feed carts or we have uh, automated grain mm -hmm. feeders or automated, and I'm saying from a tie cell perspective now, automated uh, baleage feeders even, or even moving a round bale or something like that up and down that uh, feed alley, if, if suddenly we've taken 12, 14 inches of space away from that feed alley because we've pushed that neck rail forward, uh, we might run into issues if we don't have that space to work with. Um, so that's, that's a challenge that we have from a, from, a, from a barn design perspective. We might also have issues with uh, the stalls themselves, right, as far as uh, getting cows to move around more in those mm -hmm. stalls and, and cleanliness, again, it comes back to managing those cows in those stalls. Mm -hmm. if we've made it bigger. Do the cows use it more? We saw the video there. Sorry. Uh, yeah, sorry. I, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Skip so, by so it. Maybe we can start it all over then. I don't know how difficult that is, but, That's but yeah, we, we see a cow getting up and down here and we see her trying to get up in the, in the case of this stall here. And, and, and it's taking quite some time. It's taking quite some time, and, and it's and you see Why? her. Well, I in in I was going to say in my professional judgment. I don't know if I want to say professional. <laughs> <laughs> yes, doctor, your yeah. professional judgment. Yeah. Why but is she but taking so without much without <laughs> seeing this live and, and really being there and, and knowing measurements, etc., it looks like the the tie rail in this case is, is is too low for that animal. And and I don't I can't see how offset it is either. So if it is pushed forward at all, but in this case, if it's not right. And it's, it's at that height, it's going to be difficult. And she's trying to avoid that getting up and down. So she's really struggling trying to, trying to get that lunge as she, as she gets up in this so, case. So it would be ideal to maybe move it forward a little bit. Move it forward and, and, yeah. and maybe up as well. And maybe up, yeah. Okay. In this case here, uh, it's really just a matter of moving it forward. Yeah. Yeah, we can, we can get it to, to be moved forward and, and potentially... Um, yeah, it would create a little bit more space for her in that case. Or we could try move it up as well. You can see it actually is on an adjustable, uh, exactly. adjustable rail there. So this this is one situation which would be more easy Quite for easy. us to to okay. move. Okay. Now uh, another example. I'm moving quickly here to make sure we have enough time. But in this case here, clearly something was wrong with the bar, and and there was a neck uh, injury. 
a major, and, and and all the cows were like this. Yeah. So in this case too. So so yeah, we've got a neck rail that's placed too low for these animals, um, and and we see a lot of uh, in this facility a lot of uh, neck injuries on these cows, and so the solution here was to actually remove that neck rail. Yeah, and because they were pretty much they couldn't move it forward too much. No, you couldn't move it forward. You could you could probably move it up if you put some blocks under. You took the U bolts mm -hmm. out and and maybe put some blocks underneath okay. there or something and try get it up a little bit. Uh, but the solution in this case was actually to uh, to remove the rail and actually put in a chain uh, as, as basically a, uh, a, an attachment piece for the for the for the neck chain on the cows. And and what the producer saw in this case was, uh, and as you can see on the cows, even you can see the the um, injuries on the necks are healing quite well, and and they saw an improvement in the obviously the the healing that they saw and and the reduction in new lesions that they were observing on the mm -hmm. necks of their cows in that For scenario. All the cows. Yeah. Yes, interesting. Now another, um, I'm trying to move the <laughs> slide here, but uh, another neat example. Though this is the whole herd that we're seeing yeah. here. Another neat example here. Uh, they basically. Put the chain inside. They cut the the. Person. Yeah, so this is one of the older style type uh, dividers as well, where you actually had kind of the um, uh, I don't know what they're actually called, but basically where the comfort stalls. Yeah. That, or the am stalls. Yeah. Yeah, basically where they they come down and the cow has her neck in between, and and so um, with 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 less space there it was more difficult, right? To, or or restrictive space actually in front of those cows. So they actually decided to cut that right out and then just run that chain in between there. Uh -huh. um, again, we want to make sure in this case that, yeah, and I think from a structural stability, they left uh, uh, a significant portion of that uh, front divider there. We want to make sure that there's enough width for the cow there to uh, be able to get up and down comfortably in that scenario as well. So at least kind of 30, 36 inches of space that she can have uh, at, her, at, at the front of that stall that she's not going to be hitting into stuff when she, when she gets up and down. Now, we spent quite a bit of time talking about the neck rail in a tie stall environment, but as you mentioned, there could be some neck injuries or problems uh, with the, the bar, well, the neck rail, the bar in, in a freestyle environment. So, uh, what's the height and the position in terms so, of the So, the freestyle, um, kind of similar to, uh, let's see if we can get this to advance, sorry, <laughs> uh, folks. Um, uh, similar position uh, from a neck rail position in, in a freestall is uh, the metric or the factor that we use is about 0.83 times uh, the hip height of the cow. And, and so when we talk about this, this is the neck rail, which again is typically in a freestall to really index the cow in that stall. So whereas the, the neck rail in a tie stall is to really keep that cow tied onto in most cases as well as prevent her from walking into the feed alley, the neck rail in a freestall is really to there to uh, help index that cow and unfortunately if we keep that neck rail too low and too far back into the stall or towards the curb it's it's not only going to keep the cow out of the stall but it's mm. going to make it difficult for that cow to stand up and lie down properly so if it's too far down and too far back it's it's going to create it's going to be very difficult for that cow to to stand up and lie down properly as well as um, it's going to create that if it's too far back towards the curb, it's going to create that perching behavior, which we talked about right. as well, right, uh, right, right. as being a, a, an uh, a, a undesirable behavior in freestalls, particularly because we we have epidemiological, epidemiological uh, data to suggest that it is associated with foot problems in right. cows. And so cause and effect not completely known, but we do know that it's a behavior associated with, uh, with foot problems and lameness. And so anything that we can do, like moving that neck rail, to eliminate that behavior is going to be important for us. And and so it, just going back there, yeah, so the metric is similar to the length, basically the position of that uh, brisket in, the, in that case. We're looking at about 1.2 times the hip height to the cow. In this case, minus maybe two inches. I would actually often favor actually having it right over the over the brisket board. It's actually oh, yeah. not minusing the two inches off. But um, it, it's one of those things that I think again we want to we want to think of it from an adjustable standpoint. Exactly. We want to look at, and that's the point of the next picture. I think is we want to look at uh, what the cows are actually doing in those stalls. And I think that's the most important thing, particularly with a free stall. It's very obvious often how the neck rail position can influence how those cows are actually using yeah. those stalls. So in the case of this picture here, you see cows that basically you see it, the neck rail is 
placed quite far uh -huh. back or towards the back of the stall or the curb. And what you see is that those cows that are trying to stand in the stalls, they're, they're obviously perching. The, exactly. They have to. They can't stand with all four feet in the stalls. And, and you can imagine for that cow lying down that um, it, as she gets up and down, she's either really got to contort her body or she's going to end up hitting that uh -huh. neck rail as she gets up and down uh, in that case as well. In this example here too, I guess. Yeah, and this is the same thing, a little bit more difficult. We can't really see it. It's a little darker. Uh, but you see, again, the cows perching there, or a bunch of cows perching in the whole barn, and, and that's that basically the neck, neck rail keeping them back. And so that's one of the simplest things to do in a freestyle barn is just to look at those cows and where they're standing in those stalls and how they're standing in those stalls. And if, if, if that neck rail is clearly keeping them from being able to stand fully in those stalls and then watch them get up and down as well, uh, then we know that we've got to either move that neck rail forward or move it up. Uh, and, and both those uh, really can do the trick there. Mm -hmm. So whether you enlarge the width of your stall or, or increase the length or, or advance the bar, one of the, I guess, downsides of it could be you could have to worry that your cows are going to be dirtier, and we know that it's not something you want. In yeah, and, and we've talked about that. Again, we... we that's one of the components, right, of a stall surface. We Absolutely. talked about we want that stall surface to be, yeah, to be dry, to be non-abrasive, to be not slippery, all those good clean, things, yeah. and comfortable and soft, but we also want it to be clean. Yes. And, and so um, this is where we have really uh, basically a crossroads as far as when it comes to cow comfort. Exactly. Yeah, so if, and then we've said it before, but if we want to design stalls that are um, uh, comfortable, particularly free stalls, they're going to be well used and they're going to endure some level of dirtiness. And, and so uh, we're going to have to maintain those stalls, right, somehow. Uh, again, not only free stalls but also tie stalls. We do have a bit more flexibility with tie stalls because there are devices like a cow trainer which can be used to actually, again, index cows within those stalls. Um, are, are cow trainers going to be uh, tolerated or accepted? Well, they, they, are, they are currently an acceptable means of doing that, of indexing the cow in her stall uh, under our code of practice. Now, there are requirements in the code as far as the, um, the maximum voltage, which I will come to in a second, yeah. 2,500 volts, um, and, but also uh, requirements in terms of the positioning. So it should be positioned over yeah. the china of the cow, um, and it should be adjustable as well. Yeah. So that's one of the requirements is that it should be uh, adjustable so that we can adjust it to the size of the cow as well as for training purposes and ongoing uh, purposes uh, of use as well. So how what, what are the adjustments? adjustments that we require for the dr Well, ba basically, well, for one, we want it positioned correctly in the stall. So we have the example on the screen here where we've got, uh, for a Holstein cow, we want it. Uh, and again, this is for about a 72-inch stall, uh, say a 70 to 72-inch stall from the back curb to the manger curb. Mm -hmm. And we're looking at placing that at about 48 inches, so about uh, four feet in, and then straight up from there. And then we're looking at it being about over the chine, so that just back of the or front shoulders of the cow um, and so that's the proper placement obviously for a jersey that's the other example on the screen here it's a little bit shorter so mm -hmm. again a shorter stall maybe a um, let's say a, a 62 to 66 inch length stall and then now we're looking at about a 42 inch placement from the back of the curve and in that case what about the space and and then the space the above the cow so again for for training purposes as, as we put there uh, um, minimum of two inches of space there. It uh, doesn't have to be very long, you know, just a day or right. And, uh, yeah. and and all they have to know is that it's there once, and then and then we adjust it up and, and keep it into a, a more uh, normal space. So about four inches, or I've seen even people put them even higher than that. And then not even have them on all the time, right? Most producers would tell me that um, they they only randomly have them on uh, because their cows know that they're there and and once they've again in that training period if they felt it once and uh, and they know it's there they they won't risk they won't try it again yeah, they won't try it again yeah, yeah. And, so. and I guess when we talk about adjustment we have to remember that every time we move cows around we have yeah to and that's why the requirement is there to have them adjustable so we need to make sure that we can tailor them for individual cows within the barn all right. Um, and, and as you were just uh, mentioning, we don't have to have, I guess, uh, electricity in, in the trainer always? 
Well, it doesn't have to be on all the time. Uh, um, and so there is a requirement in the code, like I said, for a maximum of 2,500 volts. Um, I think there's some interest in, in uh, we're, we're still learning a little bit more about what that number should be and if it should actually be uh, lower. A, well, well, a voltage or an amperage, actually. Oh, right. Uh, I'm not an electrician. I'm not going <laughs> to get into that. Don't ask me questions about that. But, oh. but we know that it actually probably should be measured in amperage um, uh, or that, that maximum should be. However, uh, we do know that's the case for this case. We, we do know that these systems should be, and, and that's something very important, should be well-grounded. Right? So not mm -hmm. grounding to something in a barn, but actually grounded outside the barn because if we ground to anything in the barn, then we run the risk of there being stray voltage and, right. and tingle voltage in the barn. So those are things that we want to avoid, obviously, um, in that scenario as well. Now, not everybody's comfortable or agrees to use trainers. So uh, I guess then it comes back to adjusting the bar properly. Yeah, so we can we can think about ways of then again indexing that cow in that stall so one one option in this case so this going back to the stall here which you see in the picture it might be to actually take that neck rail and place it a little bit forward and down actually which is going to help again if she's eating and, and she, her head's down it won't interfere with her she won't have pressure on that stall but it might also help when she's actually trying to urinate or defecate it might actually cause her to stand in a position similar mm -hmm. to what a um, the trainer would actually and, and cause her to arch up and, and mm -hmm. kind of move back and, and, and so that she does urinate and defecate into the into the gutter in that case. Mm -hmm. um, I guess we're finishing here with a, a cow that's asking for our help <laughs> <laughs> and she doesn't have friends. What's going on here? <laughs> so yeah and again yeah what's wrong here and, and I think this is what I would urge you to do for all the things that we've discussed. It's kind of a take home is is look at your cows. We've talked about that. Looking at injuries, looking at lameness, looking at the behavior of the cows. Um, we can do scientific assessments of these things, but a lot of times uh, just simply walking into a barn and really taking a, a discerning look at what the cows yeah. are actually doing. And in this case here, if you watch her get up and down, you'd see her you see her head's already through the side divider there. She's going to have to lunge to the side because she's got no space at the front, right? She's going to hit that cement wall if she tries to lunge forward in that case. So, so yeah, she's going to want to lunge, uh, lunge sideways. And then it makes it difficult to have friends, right? Exactly. If every time I get How's up, that? I'm going to hit into you, well, <laughs> you're not going to have very many friends in that no. case, right? So, so that's what you're going to see in, with your cows as well, right? So. Yeah, but... Happily, we do have friends, and we have take-home message for them today. Uh, this was our last webinar uh, of the series of three. It was for fun. The, it was fun. It was, well, I'm glad you had fun. <laughs> anyway, uh, and, and for those of you attending today, if you um, missed the first two webinars or either one of the two, uh, Know that all the recordings and documents are available on the Dairy Knowledge website. You can go and watch them. It's not as fun as watching us live, and you can't see our no, faces. No, I'm disappointed. I know. You only see the slides. <laughs> exactly, I know. Or maybe I know. I'm not disappointed. <laughs> well, I'm not we had sure. many complaints of uh, participants watching the recordings and not yeah. seeing <laughs> Anyway, uh, but, uh, you know... That's a compromise. Yeah. You know, we've been talking about compromise <laughs> a lot. Um, and so you will see that throughout those three webinars, really what we our key uh, messages, messages were that we want comfortable cows because... Well, because... A com <laughs> I have to say it. Yeah. Yes. You know... Yeah. Well, it goes back to the first webinar, which is really... Yeah. We want comfortable cows that are going to be in good health and, and good production. And so um, uh, a comfortable cow, as, as the data we've shown you, should result in less injuries, less lameness, increased uh, longevity of cows, so less risk of, of calling in those animals. And, and, and with that, uh, we should see better profitability with older mm -hmm. cows, more longevity, and, and there's a potential of improvement in productivity in those individual cows as well as we've, as we've demonstrated through, through this process. And we are really, I think, we hope that, I hope that we made this demonstration throughout the three webinars. We're not talking here about huge uh, modifications and no, huge investments. Not all these things require, uh, very few actually require new barns, or, right? Uh, again, if oh, people yeah. are building new facilities, well then, yeah, think obviously about think about it, look at what your neighbors are doing, look at what the science and the data tells us, and th those are all very important Call Trevor. Things. Yeah. 
Um, but if if we're yeah looking at making improvements in our barn, there's little little things that we can yeah. do, right? Yeah. And 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 little things we can even try on subsets of stalls, right? Which yes. are gonna Good potentially suggestion. have big impacts. And that, and then it's by improving step by step and little steps like this that we're all going to be prepared also for proaction. Yeah, yeah. As as a proaction animal care assessment uh, starts, uh, th these things are going to be beneficial for producers because that process is supposed to be um, focused on continuous improvement as well. And and so we're hoping that through uh, education, not only through that process, but broader education like this, we can yes. we can look to making continuous improvement in our dairy farms. And, and we want uh, our Canadian dairy producers to be as successful as possible, and this is uh, uh, one contribution to that. Yes. So uh, again, after this last webinar today, you will be able to access the recordings, share it to your colleagues, to your clients, to uh, anybody who, think, who you think w would benefit from you know, uh, hearing these these webinars, they will be online uh, on our YouTube channel of, at the Lactus for as long as we <laughs> as long as they're relevant. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, uh, so all documents will be available there. Uh, before we leave, I think I will first like to thank you, Trevor. This was quite a challenge. Uh, you had to adapt to content that was developed by uh, by other people, first of all, and uh, and also you had to travel to uh, to Quebec every yeah, time you came for those three webinars. So thank you very much. No it problem. Was this is a pleasure for me. I, yeah, it was great. So good, good. I love talking. <laughs> I love talking about cows. I love talking about the science of, of cow comfort and the behavior of cows. Yes. So do you? I, I do. <laughs> I don't know All if that's right. a sad thing or a good thing, but <laughs> I do. Right. Before we leave, actually, uh, I would like to ask the participants. It's uh, important to us to uh, find out if you attended all three webinars, uh, two of them or one of them. Actually, the best one being today, right? Uh, we shouldn't say that because then they won't go back and watch the first two. <laughs> so please answer this question. And while you're answering, I would like to take this opportunity first to, uh, well, first I thank you, but to thank the rest of the uh, the team, uh, Steve, Ada, and Marie Christen, who co coordinated this whole project, uh, people from the... the um, well, the technical team here at Valacta, uh, Marc, Xavier, Todd, uh, uh, I would like to thank also, uh, I hope I'm not forget, forgetting anybody, but, um, well, Marc Bellair, Annick Perron, anyway, anybody here at Valacta that help us. And also, well, I would like to thank you, the participants, for being there. Uh, this was a great yeah. experience for yeah. all of us. The, the folks and at uh, Dairy Farmers of Canada as well. Uh, exactly. Uh, they Shelley were my and dessert. Amy. And Shelley and Amy, thank you for, yeah. for having confidence in us. What are you? <laughs> oh, oh yeah. Well, as we uh, yeah. <laughs> as we cheer, uh, forty three percent uh, of uh, participants. We're in all three. That's very good. Yes, so I'm very happy good. About that as well. So and half half of the participants were there for the two for two of them, and seven percent one. So you have to go what to the yeah. two other yeah. ones. <laughs> Thank you very much, yes. uh, everybody, and uh, well, yeah. Have a great day. Yeah, have a great day. <laughs> all right. <laughs> All right.